G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give BetterHelp a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, is there something stopping you from achieving your goals? Is there something that gets in the way of you feeling happy or successful? Well, BetterHelp can help you with this. BetterHelp is a safe and private online environment where you can connect securely with a professional counsellor. They're a wonderful organisation that offers some truly impressive flexibility, from their ability to start communicating with their clients in under 48 hours, to their service being available worldwide, it really is amazing just how much they can do. You can send messages to your counsellor anytime and get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions too. And all without ever having to sit in those mind-numbing waiting rooms. BetterHelp is also more affordable than traditional offline counselling and even financial aid is available if you need assistance with that. Everything you share is completely confidential and you can also check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. In fact, there are so many people now using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counsellors in all 50 states. I was super impressed with their professionalism when I spoke to my therapist about some of my goals and how to work through some of the challenges I'm having with my sleep schedule, or lack thereof at the moment. It was great airing out my frustrations and thinking through what else I could do. So, I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash be scared. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash B-E-S-C-A-R-E-D. Betterhelp dot com slash be scared. So, to put this into context, I'm a 20-year-old girl, I live in the suburbs in a small residence of six houses, and my gate is almost always broken, including today. That means like 80% of the time, it's wide open, so everyone can fit into the small courtyard. My house has one floor, there are four bedrooms, including mine, and downstairs there's a guest bedroom which is used as a sort of treatment room because I have big health concerns. This is where all the equipment and the medicines are stored, and this is also where the care takes place. Also, I have a dog. I'm very, very close to him. He's a little bit of all my life, to be honest. He feels everything to the point of feeling my epileptic seizures before they happen, to recognizing the nurses who are arriving, he recognizes by the sound of their tires when they arrive in the yard. He never barks to, except when there's a problem. And finally, a nurse spends like four to five times a day to give me care at my home, including infusions. This is important for the story. So that morning, like every morning, my liberal nurse arrived at 8am. For the rest of the story, I'll call her Sandra as well. She takes care of me as usual. That is to say, an infusion of a painkiller, she replaces the antibiotic diffusers, she takes a blood test and remakes the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing really. She tells me stories with patients during the treatment. My nurses are an integral part of my life. They've looked after me for six years now. She leaves after 40 minutes and says to me, see you later, I think I'm going to be a little bit late today but don't worry. That day I have a medical appointment in the morning and I'm alone all day because my parents are working, except the nurse's passages every four hours. Once back from my meeting, I sit on the sofa with my dog while waiting for my nurse. After a while I hear the tire noises, I get up because I think it's the nurse, but this time my dog started growling behind the door. I look at the time, 11.50am. I tell myself that it's a bit early, but sometimes instead of going after, my nurse exchanges me with the patient from before, so I didn't think too much of it. I hear knocking, I'm surprised I gotta open it, usually the nurses just come in like that, and I see a young woman standing there who I've never seen. She says to me, hello, are you, not my name, I'm Camille. A third year nursing student. Your nurse will be a little bit late, so she told me to come and start preparing and she'll arrive soon. 
I'm not too concerned. I'm used to students coming, to be honest, but I'm just a little bit surprised that Sandra didn't warn me. Because usually she warns me in the morning or sends me a message or something. Even then, she never leaves a student alone when it's the first time that we've seen each other. I tell myself that she must have forgotten to tell me. I bring her in and show her the way to the treatment room. I take out the things for treatment while she washes her hands and my dog is just really weird. He growls at her as soon as she approaches me and turns to come around me. I was embarrassed so I left him in the living room and closed the door to be quiet. I don't really care what she does. I let her do it. I'm on my phone at the moment anyway. She begins to put the IV on the infusion stand and takes a syringe. Normally we rinse my central catheter with a syringe of a fire serum already made. You just have to open the packaging. And there I see that it's not a pre-made syringe but a syringe that she has prepared. I look up and see all of the stuff on my treatments are intact and haven't been opened. Yet I did hear the sound of something breaking. I'm starting to think that this is weird. And there she starts to approach me to inject the syringe when I get a message from my nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. Can you start pulling out the material? And man, did my blood run cold. I got up and said, Oh, uh, I'm just going to the toilet. I'm, I'm sorry. I ran and locked myself in the downstairs toilet. The whole time my dog was barking and growling and carrying on. And when I opened the door, he followed me straight up so that we were both in the toilet. I sent a message to my nurse that there was another student nurse here, don't worry. And she replied with, who? It was at this point that I started crying in the toilet and was really, really scared. This woman came up to me and said, is everything okay? I think that she could see that I was staying a long time in there. And I said, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'll be right out. Then I heard my front door slam. Two minutes later, I hear it reopen, but this time, I hear my nurse. I came out of the toilet crying, and she asked me what happened. I told her about it and showed the treatment room, and so we called the police. They came, they examined, took samples, the syringe, and the rest of whatever this woman had prepared. The test results were received a few days after receiving the products in the syringe and the infusion. And in the syringe was a paralyzer. She had put a dose that could have paralyzed a man of 120 kilos apparently and I'm only 40. And in the IV it was a medicine to lower the heart rate but it was so concentrated that it could have stopped anyone's heart. Today we still have no idea who this person was and luckily I never heard from her again. I want to specify too that she stole all of my opioids but no other things like my tablet which was on the bed of my computer which was in the living room. In retrospect I realize that my dog sensed that this person didn't mean me well and I tell myself that I should have watched her because she was just a student and that my treatments are not paracetamol and all that and I keep wondering what could have happened if I hadn't looked at my phone that day. I will give you guys the news as soon as I have it, and if you have any questions, then don't hesitate to ask. Thanks for listening as well. It was a scary ordeal and something that I'll never forget, but anyway, I hope you guys have a nice day. So the quick backstory to this is that it was about 2013 to 2014 and I'm living in San Jose, California. I'm a bit of a weed smoker and this was before recreational cannabis passed so I and my friend were downtown going to one of the cheaper places to get some. Nothing was remarkable. The day was fine and completely unmemorable to be honest. Aside from what happens next. So upon walking to my car with my friend from the clinic, a woman rushes to us and frantically begins pleading for help. She claims a small group of men tried to rob her for her purse and she claimed that she just escaped. But also is fearful that they're looking for her or something. She begged for a ride in the end and my friend implored me to help and the woman was by herself in broad daylight. 
she didn't seem to be a threat. Now, at that moment, I'm caught by her little story, and with the sort of rush of the situation, I quickly give her the benefit of the doubt, I suppose. I simply let her in the car and decide to drive off. On the drive, my friend is making small talk with her, and I then start more actively assessing the situation. This woman is suddenly calm as a cucumber and pleasantly engaging in small talk. Something seems off. I bring up the notion of informing the police. After all, it is broad daylight, and if there is ever a chance to catch them, it would be right then. She is safe in my moving car, but no. She shrugs off the notion with a degree of passivity that is quite striking. There were no anxious words, not even understandable fears of police involvement, just this indifference to the question. It's clear that she would continue to ignore the topic in favor of more small talk too, so I just drop it. She's in a good mood. She's far from withdrawn. She's talking about all sorts of random stuff with a smile, like the vibes of any common sociable person on a pleasant day. We decide then that we'll drop her off at her home and she'll reward me with some weed. I didn't really need the weed, but she said that she had it on her already and wanted to reward me for the help. And she insists. I start remembering the moment that she ran into us, though. She must not have been running for more than 15 seconds because she never had to catch her breath in the slightest. I'm no fitness expert by any means, but I've worked out my fair hours and taken some martial arts too and... It doesn't take a doctor to know when someone is in fear for their safety and running for their life, right? Uh, there's a heavy demand that gets put on the body. I may as well have just picked her up from a leisurely stroll, though, the way she was acting. It's worth noting, too, that she looked nearly middle-aged, I suppose, and not in the best of health. She didn't look in terrible health either, though. Anyway, out of nowhere, she rolls down my window and lights up a cigarette. Now, I actually smoke cigarettes too, but it is the most basic respect to ask before you light up in a car, right? I, I wasn't even smoking one myself in the car at this point. I tell her that I did not give her permission to smoke in the car, and she says, It's okay, I'll lash out the window. What the heck, right? I tell her clearly to put it out now, and she then just quietly and shamelessly refuses. In my mind, I just say, Screw it. Something is up with her and I just wanted to get out where she has to be and move on with my day. I'm listening to some random pop station on my car radio. The woman now gleefully proclaims loudly, Oh, I love this song. She proceeds to awkwardly move up from the back seat right in between me and my friend and tries to raise the volume. I move her hand away politely and tell her that the volume was loud enough. She doesn't accept my volume and proceeds to attempt to wrestle me to raise the volume. This woman is far from anything resembling hysterical, and I need to emphasize how calm she is, trying to wrestle the driver of a moving vehicle simply to listen to loud pop music. It is some really odd stuff, and I'm driving on terrible roads of downtown San Jose at this point still, and the roads here get legit dangerous to even focus drivers. But I move my hand away to see how far she'll put it and assume she'll stop at some point. But she raises the volume to a ridiculously painful volume and just sits back down. So I then cut the volume, take off the faceplate of the radio and throw it to the side. And I tell her, no more music then. She calmly continues small talk as if nothing at all happened. But one question might be, of course, if she was some sort of a psychiatric condition affecting her ability with social interaction or something like that. I truly doubt that though. This woman was actually quite charismatic and not in any way awkward, despite the cigarette and radio behavior up to this point in the story anyway. She was actually pretty remarkably pleasant to talk to. She was a social butterfly, I would say. She picked up on standard social cues without a doubt. And another question is, was she psychotic? Funnily enough, I actually have a psychotic condition myself, bipolar 1 with psychosis. The psychosis is some really heavy stuff and it is an extremely disassociative experience. And when you are truly psychotic, it is incredibly difficult to hide entirely. And this woman demonstrated that she had the general grasp of reality typical of someone absent of clinical psychosis. And the obvious other question was if she was on drugs. 
I actually have had known heavy drug abusers in my life. You name it, I've seen it pretty much. Two people close to me were unable to battle their addiction to the point that it tragically took their lives as well. But anyway, I've done my best to express how strikingly normal she expressed herself. She exhibited no identifiable sign of an intoxicated person. The cigarette thing and the radio madness came across as extremely inconsiderate, but sober and even sociable at that. And trust me, I've grown far too familiar with what those signs of intoxication are at this point in my life, so it wasn't that either. We then approach, though, where she says her home is. She says that it's in an apartment complex on the street that we're driving down. I'm feeling glad that I can drop her off and rid myself of the feeling of creepiness lingering in me. But the next part is where I have my biggest questions. So instead of just waiting on that street, she adamantly requests that we pull into this shady little motel right next to the apartment complex. At this point, I'm wondering why she's requesting the motel when there is clearly room on the street. But I feel that I can get her out of the car if I just surrendered that much, so I pull in. The lot is small and the spaces are all full as much as I can tell. There's no place to park and... And as I drive down the lot, I see a group of men standing in a circle talking to each other by a huge, nice truck. They're all pretty well dressed, not too formal, but certainly professional. One of them turns around to make eye contact with me as I drive past. He stares me down the entire time that I drive past the group, and the only way to make the exit at that point is to flip a U-turn at a spacious corner in the lot. Upon flipping it, I drive back where I was entering, and immediately notice that the truck is gone and all the men are no longer there either. It didn't take long at all to spin my car around, mind you. In fact, I made a deliberate effort to sort of slip around quickly. They literally all up and vanished though within the span of like a minute at the absolute most. They had to have booked it out of there with extreme urgency to have vanished just like that and there were too many men for one truck. Seven to ten people were in that original group at least. But then the woman said to park in the spot that the truck had just been at previously. She told me her weed was in her room and she would go and get it. This was actually different than her original story. She was clear about having it on her already before this point. To be honest though, at this point, I'm just trying to get her out and leave myself so I tell her that it was fine. I insist that I don't need any compensation and she's free to just go to her home. She insists a few more times and I politely tell her that it's fine over and over again and she gets more frustrated trying to get me to park in that damn spot. And eventually she raises to a more aggressive tone and says, you're stupid and I reply, no, I'm just trying to be nice. And that was the last thing that she said as she walked out of the car too. She left the cigarette butt in the car as well. Now, truthfully, I don't know for sure if she had any sinister plans for me and my friend. My mind tells me that the men may have tried to rob me of my car had I parked it, but I can't say for certain. Maybe I'm just being paranoid, I don't know, but all I know is that she behaved in a manner that felt really unsettling to me and really suspicious. I felt like I was quite respectful, despite all of the craziness that went on. My friend agreed too that it was an uncomfortable situation and that I did the right thing. Others have told me that it was a very questionable situation as well, but I don't know. What do you guys think? In 2011, I was a sophomore in high school and was hanging out with my friend Hadley. We live in the Rust Belt and the population of our area has declined a lot in the last 40 to 50 years. So schools were merged as a result of declining enrollment, which means that there are a lot of abandoned schools. I lived in a small town on the PA Ohio border and the abandoned school was a hotspot for teenagers and stuff who wanted to smoke and break windows and just overall cause havoc. My friend and I were in a breezeway type area. You could just step right in over a 1.5 foot wall because all of the glass had been broken out. And all of a sudden, a guy comes around the corner and grabs my friend, telling her to come with him. 
but we think it's a guy who intends to call the cops, so we just book it out of there and walk to my cousin's house down the street. It's the day before my aunt's birthday. Also, it was a super moon that day. So, all of my family is at my cousin's house and we hang out with them for a bit. They all end up going out to eat, but my cousin Hadley and I, we stay back at the house. It's now dark outside, but we're sitting in my cousin's stoop and smoking cigarettes, when all of a sudden, we see a man walking down my cousin's driveway, from the direction of her garage, not the direction of the street, and he has his coat pulled over his mouth and his hat pulled down to his eyes, so only his eyes and nose were visible, and he's making a, a strange gesture at us. At first glance, I, I thought that he was jangling keys at us, so me being stupid think that it's our uncle trying to give us the house keys and I walk up to him and my cousin says, Jake, get away from him, man. And now that I'm a little bit closer, I can see what he's doing. He is touching himself. We turn around, run around the house to the front door. The door to the stoop was literally never ever used and was blocked with a bunch of stuff because it opened up to a storage room and we thankfully get inside. The guy gets to the front door after us and finishes all over the sliding glass door and then runs back towards her garage into the woods. We are totally freaking out. We call the cops obviously, they ask us some questions and then they leave. Now about a week later, a girl who graduated from our high school heard about what happens and remember seeing a car parked on the street behind my cousin's garage and had actually taken down the license plate number. She reports the number to the police, and it's registered to an Ohio man. We're in PA, but literally only about a quarter mile from the PA-Ohio border, so not much is really done. But then a few weeks later, this same car chases a woman from Walmart into Youngstown, Ohio, and attempts to follow her inside and sexually assault her. He's arrested. It turns out that he allegedly had a habit of trying to do this to people in Walmart parking lots in both Newcastle, PA and Youngstown, Ohio. He faced charges in both states and my cousin and friend and I were all subpoenaed to testify against him. When we go to court, we see his mugshot and the guy who, well, touched himself and chased us. It was the same guy who grabbed my friend in the abandoned school that night. He wasn't going to call the cops either. He was going to try and have his way with her. He got a few years in prison, but I believe that he got out in 2015 or 2016 or something. So yeah, we were lucky that day, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. So, I think that this is important to the story. I was a preteen, you see, when this happened, but I hit puberty early enough that I looked like a young teenager. So, we used to have a tiny barn on my property, and it was my job to milk our dairy goats every morning. So, every single morning, at almost the exact same time, I'd be in the back corner of our lot to milk and all that stuff. It was in a fairly isolated area of our yard, and between three neighbours' fields or pastures, which was intentional since goats can be talkative, so it was right beside our neighbour's chain link fence or grapevines. I would sing fairly loudly every morning too, since there was generally nobody to be bothered, and it calmed down the goats, at least a little. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it was easy to know that there was a girl back there every morning and night. This particular morning though, my mum had a bad feeling and made my little brother go with me. He was bored so he messed around and collected eggs while I milked. There were little windows all around, including a wide one right behind me, and the doors were wide open so I figured that he'd come back eventually. Well, I saw him walk past the doors and start talking to somebody. I figured that it was the neighbour, so I didn't worry when he said, Okay, I'll go get my mum, and took off. Then I heard the chain link fence behind me rattle, and I turned around just in time to see a man launch himself over the chain link fence into the neighbour's yard. Apparently, he'd been watching me and waiting since before I got into the yard. I don't know what he would have done if my mum hadn't have made my brother go with me that morning, but... 
Uh, I did get out of goat milking solo though for quite some time. I live in a small rural community in the eastern US. It's a nice little town, and because of my work in the medical field, I've met some uh, interesting folks. I'm also familiar with the law enforcement and emergency personnel. Small town life is not as dull and uneventful as people think, I guess. Especially since everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. I have a lot of stories to share, in fact, but since this one just happened, I'll start here. Also, because it's still very recent and the investigation is ongoing, I have to be vague with some details, but I just need to tell someone. So, I'm single and I live alone. Due to a stalker, I've moved twice, but that's another story for another time. However, it is relevant for this story for multiple reasons. The first reason being that I have a dog for the sake of protection, as well as have motion sensors and outdoor security cameras. The second reason being that the location of my home, which is literally down the street from the fire department, I can see it from my living room window, is also a couple of blocks from the police station. However, next to the fire department is the road department, which is basically a parking lot where they park their road equipment and empty garbage trucks at night and on weekends. Oddly, it doesn't have a security camera. Small town life, I suppose. Anyway... My house sits on a hill with a good view of that side of the street, and due to the incline, the large trees in the front yard, and the half cornfield on the property next to me, most people on the street below wouldn't notice me in the backyard, unless they were sort of actively looking. However, I can see the street very clearly, and this incident happened Saturday evening. The county was holding its annual Independence Day spiel with a community barbecue, music, fireworks, etc., I didn't attend because it's just not my thing. Plus, I have a dog, like I said, and the sound of fireworks could be traumatizing. But before the big show, I took the dog out to relieve herself in the backyard. There was still at least an hour of daylight, but the entire neighborhood was pretty quiet because most everyone was at the fairgrounds or various other holiday events. So when an unfamiliar large white pickup drove slowly down the street, I definitely noticed it. It must have turned around at the end of the street because I saw it again moving in the opposite direction, only about 20 seconds later. This time, it turned into the parking lot of the road department. Now, people have been known to toss things in the empty garbage trucks, usually at night to avoid getting caught, because they don't want to or are unable to make the trip to the landfill themselves. Usually it's things like, I don't know, furniture or broken equipment, but I didn't see any of these things in the back of this truck. The driver was a somewhat stocky guy of average height. He looked, he took three large black trash bags from the bed of his truck and tossed them one by one into the hopper of the garbage truck. Then he left. Now, I swear that I'm not one of those meddling rear window types who always thinks activity is suspicious and that their neighbors are up to no good but something about this didn't sit right with me. Normally, when I see people tossing their garbage into the trucks and leaving, I don't bother reporting it because it's relatively harmless. But this time, I don't know, I had a gut feeling. So I called the cops. If anything, they could get the guy for illegally dumping trash from a barbecue or whatever. While I'm on the phone though with dispatch, I put my dog inside to cut down on distractions while the officers investigate. A few minutes later, an officer arrived and I crossed the street to meet him, gave him a description of the events and pointed out which of the trucks the man had tossed his bags. He found the bags, he took photos, he put on gloves and told me to stay back. The bags were tied in a knot at the top and it took him a minute to untie one because of the gloves and how tight the knot was, but eventually he got it open, looked inside for a few seconds, then twisted it closed and took a few steps back. Oh no, he said under his breath. What is it? I asked. It's... it's a body. I felt sick. I could tell that he felt sick too. 
Uh, I saw him grow pale. His hand was trembling when he held the radio. Even his voice was shaking as he gave the code to dispatch. The dispatcher sounded confused when she asked him to repeat it. And within 10 minutes, the county sheriff was on the scene. Even he looked sick at the contents of the bag. But the coroner arrived about 10 minutes after that and the first officer walked me back to the house along with another one who arrived at the same time as the coroner. Though I showed the first cop via the app on my phone when I described the events initially, I now showed them the video on a larger screen. The camera caught footage of the truck as it drove by both times, as well as pulling into the parking lot, though unfortunately not a clear view of the license plate or of the man tossing the bags out of frame. But we watched the footage over and over, pausing frames and trying to get different angles, the officers taking notes. Ultimately, they requested this footage as well as a copy of the files from the past week to see if the truck had been in the area before. I've also been saving footage until the road department installs their own camera this week, so that was useful. But because this is all still so fresh though, I don't know any more details. But what I do know is that everything was in pieces, but I don't know the age of the victim, the gender, the cause of death, any of that. Information hasn't been released to the public either. I don't know if the coroner has even been able to identify the body yet, to be honest. A police cruiser has been parked at the fire department next door for constant surveillance in case the guy comes back as well. And the guy who dumped the body is apparently likely a local. Which makes sense because how else would he know to dump them there, right? He probably thought that it would get buried in other people's illegal trash accumulated over the holiday weekend and the sanitation crew wouldn't have bothered to investigate. But when I think about how this guy lives in my community, it makes me feel physically ill. To think that he'd clearly scouted the area for a dump site, that it may not have been the first time that this had happened, that this could happen again. If I hadn't have called it in, if I hadn't have been in the backyard at that exact moment, or if I had ignored that gut feeling, the victim would never have even been found. May never have found potential justice. Their loved ones may never even have closure. In fact, there's a possibility that it just might happen again to another poor soul. I hope that it's just not me. Please, don't let it be me. In fact, I think that it's time that I moved again. Third time's a charm, right? So, this story happened to me sometime in 2014. I've never told anyone about it. You'll see why in a minute. But I thought that you guys might find it interesting. I'm almost 30 now and thinking about it still keeps me awake at night sometimes. But keep in mind, I never did drugs, I don't drink alcohol or anything like that. So each summer, my family and I would visit my granddad's house where he, my uncle and two aunts live. My uncle is a self-proclaimed treasure hunter in North Africa, these hunter people would supposedly employ demons through some creepy rituals as well to guide them to hidden old valuables buried in some secret places. I know, weird. My uncle is pretty knowledgeable about demons and jinns though because of this. And one night, after having a big North African dinner with the family, I hung around with my uncle in his room. I just always liked to listen to his creepy stories. He decided to show me though that night a stack of old Islamic witchcraft books and manuscripts. Among them was one called The Great Secret to Attract the Beloved, a rough translation from Arabic. The book was a bit hard to read as it was old and handwritten. I browsed randomly and it was some sort of a talisman with instructions. You had to draw some sort of a table and within the columns you draw some letters or something. You then take the paper and put it under your pillow and this supposedly will bring you a lover. Seems silly to me, but fun to try, so I thought why not? So eventually I slept and I woke up sometime in the early morning. I still remember it too as it was a little bit bright and the pigeons would get really loud at that time as well. But this sound was not actually what woke me up. 
It was actually the weight of a woman on my waist. I got woken up by a lady. Well, you can guess what she was doing. I was, yeah, and there was no pleasure, but all I felt was just terror. The lady had no face. It was darker than the room. Abyss kind of dark. She had like glowing neon red hair that burnt me as well whenever she'd bounce and like every good Muslim guy, I looked away and started reciting verses of the Quran and I looked back at her and she was just gone. But my pants were down and I was immediately lost in thought. The next day, my uncle saw me acting sort of weird and distant and asked me why. I hesitated a lot but eventually I told him about it. Not sure if he was joking, but the dude told me that it's just his ginger familiar. She likes to play with young guys. I kid you not, that's exactly what he said too. And uh, I have not spent a night there since then. Fast forward three days later though, back in our room. I was asleep and I have this dream. I'm walking in a dark tunnel, I get shivers and... I reach to my pocket and find my phone and just as I turn my flashlight on, it revealed a naked black man kneeling. I approached him and touched his shoulder and he stood up. He kept standing up and he was really tall. He smiled at me with huge white teeth and I woke up from the dream unable to move. I guess it was some sort of sleep paralysis or something. Anyways, I was unable to move and I start looking around with my eyes and a figure stands up from the edge of my bed. And it was the same dude from my dream. He stood there for a moment and looked at me. I tried to scream but nothing came out of my throat and then he just vanished in a cloud of like really dark smoke, darker than the dark of the room. He turned to smoke and then appeared right to the side of my bed he stood there again, tall and completely naked. His face slowly got closer to mine and just as I made eye contact with him, he smiled at me and vanished in smoke. I could finally move. I stood up and just sort of breathed for a moment. I went to drink some water, unable to believe what had just happened. The next day, I get awoken up at 8 in the morning by my alarm. With my eyes half closed, I try to reach for the phone to shut it down, but... I get blocked by something. I thought that it was my brother, but when I looked, my hand was blocked by what I can only describe as like a midget's hand. A midget who had the face of the brother of one of my friends. He then laughed at me and ran away towards the door with his short legs. And I know it sounds kind of comical, but man, when you go through this stuff, it is freaky. Since then, I started praying and I've not seen any of them again. I like to think that they were just sleep paralysis episodes, but to be honest, I'm not so sure. My partner and I are avid hikers. Last July, we went on a trip and decided to camp at this spot that we love. It's quiet, off the beaten path, and offers absolutely spectacular views of portions of George Washington National Forest to the west. And the first day and evening of the trip itself was really nice and uneventful, though we didn't sleep super well because of the humidity. The next morning, though, we decided to go for a hike in a portion of Jefferson Forest. We'd never been there before. It's comprised of ATV trails and about a dozen campsites, but has a trail that leads to an old fire tower that we'd always wanted to check out. It was about a 45 minute drive from our campsite, mostly on back roads. When we got there, the first thing that struck out to us was how empty the campsites were. But we actually didn't camp there the night before because we'd heard that the site is usually packed and we knew that we wouldn't arrive early enough in the weekend to get a spot. There were only two spots taken though. In one was a sort of desiccated tent and a bunch of garbage. It looked like someone had been there for a while, but it was deserted when we arrived. In the other, there was a young woman, I'm guessing in her late teens, setting up a small backpacking tent. There was a truck and one other smaller car in the parking area. And that was it. 
We parked and started getting our gear together and the woman approaches us to ask if we knew where the trailhead was. I told her that we'd read that it branched off about 100 yards into one of the ATV tracks but we weren't 100% sure which. Since I was getting such weird vibes from the place, I kind of hoped that she'd stick around and go with us to find it but she just thanked us and took off in the general direction of the trail. We set off and walked up and down a few of the ATV trails until we found the walking path. We saw two ATVs shoot by us at one point, but otherwise didn't encounter another soul, including the woman from earlier. It took us about an hour, I would guess, to get to the top of the mountain where the fire tower was. It's an old metal structure and you have to climb to a narrow set of stairs to get to the top of it. We got up, looked around, took some pictures, and started heading down. Honestly, the view was kind of a letdown, but about halfway down, very suddenly, everything just sort of stopped. The birds, the bugs, everything, even the wind. It was just dead silent. I don't know how quite to put it into words, but it felt like the ancientness of the forest was contorting and sort of crushing us. I felt trapped all of a sudden and cornered in spite of the expanse around us. My partner and I looked at each other and wordlessly started to book it out of there. But we started running back to the car but the feeling only followed us and as we were rounding one of the switchbacks we heard this unearthly shriek like a cross between metal on metal and a choir singing off key. And we also saw something. I just got a glimpse of it before we blacked out, but I don't know how to describe it other than it looked huge, despite clearly not taking up much physical space and moved in sort of writhes and flashes. It didn't have a color, it just felt like evil and emptiness. I probably only perceived it for like half a second before my memory just completely gives way. When we came to, we were sitting in the car and two whole hours had passed, double the length of time it took us to get up there. I don't know if we lost consciousness or just somehow blocked those hours out. I learned later the exact same thing had happened to my partner as well. Both of the cars were next to us in the parking lot and there were still just the two tents at the campsite. The woman wasn't in hers and it looked exactly the same way as she'd left it. I think about her all the time and have spent a ton of time trying to figure out if someone went missing around the time of our trip. It took a few months for my partner and I to even talk about that day. And some of the stories that I've shared here have made me feel less alone. It was a scary ordeal and I still don't have answers. We still love to hike but honestly I haven't been able to go into the Appalachian Forest since this happened. I'm curious if others have had other experiences like this because it's a, a real head scratcher, that's for sure. I've been running in these woods for well, as long as I can really remember, but this, this might make me change my mind. So the story began at around 6.30pm. I had finished eating and decided to go on a run as usual. I always use the same path and cross the street, run for about a kilometer and pass the gate that goes into the woods. Something important to know too is that the trail that I use in the forest is separated about halfway through, but one path is paved and the other isn't. I usually go onto the unpaved path first and then turn onto the paved one after about three kilometers. Nothing ever really goes wrong. I meet some rare people walking their dogs occasionally, but... Other than that, I'm pretty much alone. At least, I thought that I was. You see, I'd been running for a while now when I heard a notification coming from my phone. An airdrop notification. Since I didn't want to make it look like I was worried, I kept running for a couple of minutes and then stopped to change the music. I opened the airdrop dreadfully. I mean, who the heck was sending me stuff here? I was pretty sure that I was alone. I clicked on the drop and my heart sank. It was a, a Snapchat picture of me running with the caption, you look good. 
I didn't turn around. Instead, I just kept running like nothing happened until I reached a certain point. You see, the forest is surrounded by a fence to stop children from coming in unsupervised. And I didn't like that rule when I was little, so my friends and I actually cut a hole in it. When I was aligned with that hole, I quickly turned and buried myself into the forest, aiming for my escape. And as soon as I did this, I could hear ruffling behind me. I still didn't turn back though, and when I finally reached the hole, I jumped through it and absolutely booked it to the fire station that was a couple of streets down. The last things that I could hear when leaving the forest was an angry huff and metal meeting metal. I still don't know who it was or what they wanted, but I have never run in that forest ever again. In the 14th century, the plague arrived here and with a vengeance sought to kill everyone in sight. A few managed to escape to a decent large island in one of our biggest lakes in my country, but the plague wiped them all out, one after the other. In the end, the whole island turned into basically a large cemetery, or so I've heard. Another thing too is that an author lived here in the 50s before moving to another one. The house and adjoined shed still stand. And if you have the patience to listen to me, then I can promise you that... It's pretty terrifying what I'm about to tell you. So I love the outdoors and after coming across this island on Wikipedia, I just needed to go. And then the opportunity arose. My family and I found a road close by and followed a small path to a little peninsula. The island measured at, uh, at the very least uh, half a mile long I would guess and was truly a sight to behold. It might not seem that big but it's heavily forested and covered by cliffs and large hills and it's larger than you might think when you set foot on there. Well, I swam over there and took about five minutes, and that was around 100 or 200 yards. The water was not warm, but perfectly cool enough to shield me from the blistering heat that day. Not too challenging too, and I was in a very good mood, to say the least. Immediately though, I didn't find a path, and that's why I just walked until I found one. After coming across a, a little shelter, I continued to walk. And as I was taken away by its enchanting beauty, crisp blue water which almost looked like a lagoon, a hundred feet high cliffs on a small island in northern Europe, the truth was is that it seemed so incredibly amazing, just too good to be true. My journey continued though and I went on. After finding the lagoon a looking thing and being both bewildered and amazed, I continued and, man, do I still regret that so very much. The thing that I recall the most too was that after I passed a little meadow, my mind immediately thought, and I don't know why, this will take a dark turn. And maybe I just kind of made myself think that it was different, but it just feels like this cozy and wonderful atmosphere just sort of changed all of a sudden. And it all just seemed different after that. Well, you know how I mentioned the author's house? Yeah, abandoned since the 50s. I saw it, but before I could reach those forgotten and sad looking old buildings, I needed to cross some ferns. They didn't look odd or anything like that. It just looked like a path between some patches of waist high ferns. and That was about it. But it was at this point that for every other step that I took, I heard movement from the ferns. I sort of stopped, looked around, didn't see anything. I figured that it was just a rabbit or something. Took some more steps and then the movement and snaps of twigs got closer and closer. Whatever this thing was, it was following me. Trying to shut out my increasing feeling of unease, I went up to see this old house. Coming closer, I saw just how terrible it looked. The main house and the surrounding sheds looked beautiful, but long forgotten and neglected. The lake, looking at me from behind the house, was a bit of a relief. But then, I heard voices. People were talking from inside or behind the house. Now, I was seriously horrified and got a feeling of dread that I had never felt before. 
I just wanted to jump into the lake and take an extra long route back so that I wouldn't have to be there anymore. But whoever or whatever it was that talked, I never want to meet them. Ever. So I did the only thing that I could. I ran, past the ferns, still hearing it following me. But after some very uncomfortable pacing, I finally crossed over the meadow and I felt better. In the end, I managed to swim back, but not until I came back to the shore from where I arrived, I had that feeling that someone or something was following me all that way. I still don't know what it was there on that island. It was very beautiful, but I don't think that I'm ever going to go back there after all of that. So this story happened just a few years back when I was visiting an old friend in Cologne while at the same time taking advantage of him as a free stay for a meeting with my LARP group. But for those who don't know what a LARP is, it's basically real life role playing. Imagine a and d game but instead of people sitting around a table with dice, you have people actually dressed up as their characters actually role playing in real life. LARPing, it was my hobby since I was 14 and after I got a job that paid pretty well, I started to go a bit more all out when it came to stuff for my hobby. One of those things I spent a solid amount of money on was my character's armor, which is important for this story. It was the chainmail that I wear under my outer armor. So after the meeting of my group, I got mostly out of my LARP outfit because I really didn't want to walk around in it. The place where I was is one of the more dangerous places in the city, I guess you could say, as a medieval knight especially. But since I couldn't fit all in my bag, I kept my chainmail on as well as my tunic and pants. On my bus ride home, I noticed some guy seemed to have his eye on me. But I guessed it was because I still looked very out of place in all of the stuff that I was wearing. When he got off on the same station as me, I didn't really pay much attention to it. I was almost at my friend's place too and decided to call him, asking if we should meet and get something to eat, which he agreed to before I even ended my question. I arrived at our meeting spot first and I waited. But then I noticed that the guy from the bus, he was there again, and he now walked straight towards me. I got closer to the wall to make space, but he didn't pass me. He stopped before me and pulled a knife on me demanding my bag, wallet and phone. I was willing to give him my wallet but tried to explain to him that the bag only had some armor and phone weapons but it seems that even just talking was enough to set this guy off and suddenly I felt two fast stinging punches into my stomach and man did it hurt. I dropped down and the guy grabbed my bag and honestly the next things are not really in my mind. What I mean is that I was barely able to notice anything other than the voice in my head screaming, you got stabbed. So the next thing I noticed was my friend shaking me. My bag was open and all my stuff was just all over the place. He was holding my helmet with blood on it. As he said, he saw the guy throwing my stuff around after the bag was most likely too heavy and big for him. So my friend, seeing me on the floor, managed to grab the first thing that he could, which was the helmet, and hit the guy with it until he ran. But we later checked my stomach, and even though I had two giant deep blue bruises, which, man, did they hurt, I only had small cuts since the chainmail, thankfully, stopped the knife from going through. Until this day, I still get sick in my stomach when I think back on that day, and remember that if I had not worn a piece of my LARP clothing that day, I would likely be dead. Literally killed over a bag full of costumes, 150 pounds in my wallet, and a 10 year old phone. Man, this world is a messed up place. So I went camping with my mom, dad, and my brother deep in the woods when I was about 10 years old. I remember it was morning time and the sun was just rising. There was a slight fog present in the woods around us and everyone kept remarking about how pretty it was. I had to go to the toilet so I walked down a hill to the edge of the woods towards a wooden outhouse. 
It was a good distance away from where my family had set up camp, so I couldn't hear their conversations anymore. As I approached the wooden outhouse, I heard what I can only describe as disturbing wailing and whimpering coming from the woods behind it. I really can only describe it as sounding like several people sobbing together. I remember being absolutely petrified by these strange noises, but I figured it was just my imagination and went into the outhouse, did my business, and left. When I left the outhouse, I, I paused for a moment just to listen, but the wailing was now gone, and I noticed that the fog had also let up. It seemed weird, though, that the noises had stopped so quickly. I remember asking my parents if they saw anyone down there, or if there were people in the woods which freaked them out. When I told them what I heard, they accused me of making it up just to scare them, but to this day, I always wonder what the heck those noises were, because I've never heard anything like it since. I was wondering, though, if any of you guys had any idea as to what the noises may have been. My dad always jokes that it was a group of ghosts having a bad bowel movement. Yeah, he's one of those guys, but... Anyway, I would love to get your thoughts. Thanks for listening. I was the store manager of a nationwide mall computer later gaming store. But this was long before GameStop and cell phones and all that. We were located on the left side facing the middle of the mall with JC Penney's to the left at that end. This detail too is pretty important because it plays into what happened. So my ex-wife is a strikingly beautiful Latina woman. She was only 20 and my daughter one and a half at the time. Unfortunately, but fortunately for us obviously, we had very beautiful babies. They almost look like dolls to be honest and the reason I say this is because my daughter attracted way too much attention as a baby. We stopped going out in public because people were constantly approaching us and trying to touch her. Anyway... It's a Sunday and I would work the whole day since it was a short day. The three of us would go to work. My ex-wife would dress our daughter and herself up and make a day of it. She liked to shop and wander for the day coming back to have lunch and stuff. Being the manager, I took long breaks as well. Everything is going along fine too, like any other Sunday. At some point, I go out to give her some money and my spidey street senses start going crazy. I look to the left and see a man intently looking at my wife and our daughter. I meet his gaze and he doesn't look away. We had a huge wedding with like 200 plus guests and I asked my wife if she knew the person staring at her. We both look up and he was gone. It couldn't have been two or three seconds since I last looked at the guy as well. There was something strange about this guy though. I remember that to this day. He was dressed in a sort of dark grey suit with a dark grey overcoat. Not to trouble her though, I told her not to worry about it. We had lunch and we took the long way back to the store. We stopped by mall security. I introduced her to the security guys who had become good buddies of mine. I pulled them aside and told them what had happened. They were concerned and we stopped by the info booth and I tell the person working there to let me know if she sees it. Now, my ex-wife loves to shop at JCPenney's and go shopping in that store all the time. But before she goes in, I tell her about the man in the grey suit. She let me know that she'll keep an eye out for him and that there's a call on the store phone. An employee tells me that it's the phone and I'm like, yeah, I heard it ring. He tells me that he needs some help and he pulls me inside and says, it's your wife and she sounds really scared. I quickly jump on the phone. She tells me that the man that I described has been following her for like over half an hour. And when he had first showed up, she said that he was reaching out for our daughter. I immediately called security. They come up the middle with my employee standing watch on the entrance to the JC Pennies. I go out the back into the parking garage, which was no more than like 50 feet away. And there's only two entrances into the store, front and back. There's lots of emergency exits on the parking garage side, so the only entrance not covered was, well, really the front. No luck would have it, a police officer had pulled someone over from the street and was in the front parking lot. By this point, I don't want the gentleman to go away to be honest, I want him caught. Everyone starts converging on the store, he's got nowhere to go right? 
They walk to the station where my wife is surrounded by the store manager, several employees, and they have our daughter behind the counter. The police officer had been alerted, and more security escorts both of them out of the store to me. We put them in our car, and they drive straight back to her mother's. They continue to search the store, every nook and cranny as well, but he was just never found. To this day, I can remember every detail about that guy though, but the detail that sticks with me the most, his eyes, man, they were just black, like coal. So I'm male, 31, and from a, an eastern terrible part of Europe. This happened while I was working as a security guard in 2014. But one or two months, I can't remember exactly the date. It was cold and icy, but not snowing. I was working on facilities for sewage water treatment. It was big, roughly the size of a football stadium, and it was on the edge of that city with the first house, about uh, maybe a kilometer a distance away. And the facility was on the end of a small road. It was around where some wooded areas were and farm-like places of land, and behind that there was a large river. So my shift was from 4pm to 8am, 16 hours. 4pm is when last workers get out and you're all alone until like the end of the shift pretty much. To make things worse, there was makeshift guard houses that were basically old containers with doors and one window, a few chairs, a table, an old TV and that was about it. And my job was to walk around the perimeter every one to two hours. Funny thing too as well is that it was a large and state of the art facility with like one guy guarding it without a gun or any kind of protection. Anyway, fast forward to around 1 or 2 a.m. I'm sitting in the guardhouse watching some terrible movie when I heard some noises like something had fell on the ground. My first thought was that maybe cats had knocked something off since other security guards that worked there fed some strays from time to time so they came back pretty often. So I put my jacket on and I went outside to check. Oh, something I forgot to mention too was a sound of machines that were there. It wasn't loud enough to damage your ears, but it was pretty loud and it filled the air outside and pretty much all around. Anyway, like I said, I went outside and circled around behind the guardhouse in the direction of the thuds that I heard. A few seconds later from that direction, I heard an incredible scream so strong that it deafened the sounds of all the machines that were there. When I tell this to people as well, I can't explain just how strong and long that scream was. I was completely paralyzed for some short time, I couldn't make any part of my body move. When I got to my senses though, I just turned around and went back into the guardhouse, stood in there some time. The scream came from right outside of the entrance and it was behind the metal fence as far as I could understand. When I collected myself, I put my mobile phone on recording in my front jacket pocket and took some metal bar that I found inside, opened the gate and went behind the fence 20 or 30 meters into the darkness because I wanted it to happen again so that I would have proof. But nothing happened and I went back and locked myself in the guardhouse. The next hour passed and I realized all that time that I must have been in shock or something. I was confused, just had a really strange feeling like something happened to me but I wasn't yet aware of what exactly happened. In the direction where that scream came from is a sort of long meadow and some trees and river, nothing else really. I call it a scream because I don't really know what else to call it to be honest. It wasn't a typical scream mind you, it was high but not excessively high I guess but it was strong man and... I felt like it just pierced me. A few days after that, I started to retain a little bit of the memory of that exact moment. And I can't explain or see the full picture, but I think there was something white in the distance. That's all I remember what I saw, but the sound is something that will stay with me forever. We don't have mountain lions or cougars or anything like that where I live. Two animals that can scream are foxes and pheasants. I've spent many hours listening to them and I couldn't find anything similar. Both animal noises are much shorter and weaker and the pitch was way off and all in all, 
after that, I felt confused, like I might still be missing some memory due to shock or something, and can't really remember much, just some white thing and that horrible noise. I would like to get your thoughts though on what you guys think may have happened here because I am just lost and have no idea. Years ago, I worked at a local casino. A lot of the customers could be kind of weird, but this one guy in particular who spent the evening flirting with me seemed alright, so I agreed to go on a date with him that upcoming weekend. We met earlier on a Saturday at his friend's house for a casual barbecue. Everyone seemed nice, the food was decent, but I did notice my date taking an obscene amount of jello shots. Later, we all agreed to go to a bar and hang out. My first red flag should have been the fact that my date tried to force French me and stuck his tongue down my throat. Stupid me blamed the alcohol. I know, I know, but I was young, insecure, and just didn't read the situation well at the time. But I get to a local bar and all was okay until they invited me to another party that would take place a few days later. I had other plans, so I politely declined. My date's mood immediately changed at that too, and he became very hostile and angry. Within seconds, he began yelling at me, accusing me of things, and I was completely baffled. He kept screaming and becoming more violent, and went on and on about how inappropriate it was for me to decline the invite, and how I was just trying to mess with other guys. At that point, I started to freak out, and I decided to leave. He followed me out into the parking lot where he proceeded to yell more obscenities. I told him that I was not going to talk to him anymore and tried to get into my car. And then things got worse. He suddenly grabbed me by my shoulders and shoved me into the side of my car. Then he took one hand and grabbed me by my neck while still yelling at me. He attempted to choke me while calling me a whole mess of more bad words. I screamed and told him that he was hurting me and that I would call the cops if he immediately didn't let me go. I was actually amazed too that he backed off at this point. I jumped into my car and drove away as fast as I could and I can easily say that I was never more frightened in my life. The next day at work I immediately went to our security officers which were run by state troopers and reported the assault to the officers. Since the guy was a regular visitor of the casino, I was not taking chances of running into him again. And they pulled up his long criminal record, and lo and behold, charge after charge for assault, stalking, and even kidnapping. I completely flipped out. They put him on a blacklist though, and when he showed up at the casino a few days later, he was arrested and forbidden to ever come there again. Unfortunately though, a few days later, I found out from one of my female co-workers that they knew he was kind of crazy and had a history but didn't want to tell me because I was the new girl and would figure it out for myself. I was livid and felt totally betrayed by that. And not only that, but I was paranoid that he would come after me because I had him banned from the premises. He was constantly calling and texting and left threatening voicemails on my phone that lasted almost a year, mind you. And it gets worse. In less than two weeks after all of this, another girl that I worked with ended up getting kidnapped by another regular. She was not so lucky and was held hostage for like three days in this dude's basement. He'd been coaxing her and gaining her trust for two whole years as well. Luckily, she was found and she recovered well. But as soon as I found out, I quit on the spot and I just walked out. I've never been back and I will never set foot into another casino for as long as I live. So I was told this story about myself on a long motorway journey back from a football match with my dad back in 2011. I'm 27 now, and I live in the East Midlands, UK. Shortly after I turned 18 in 2011, my dad told me this story about me from back when I was 6, and I've always found it disturbing ever since. So apparently, this happened in 1999. 
My dad was a devoted member of the church at the time with two young children, me six and my sister three. And after we'd had our dinner one evening, two men knocked on our door and tried to talk to my dad about their beliefs. I have no idea what they were or what they stood for, but after several minutes of getting nowhere with my dad, they ended up giving him a, a little booklet about their views or something. My dad felt uneasy about it and has since said that he bitterly regrets it, but he took the booklet despite feeling that it had brought a somewhat sinister energy into our room. He then went on about his evening entertaining his two young kids and eventually he put us to bed. Later on into the night though, when it was time for him and my mum to go to bed, he went into our respective bedrooms and prayed for us like he did every night. Just the usual good health, happiness, prayer any Christian father does for his kids. With my three-year-old sister, everything was fine and nothing was wrong. However, when he went into my room to do the same, something very odd happened. So he did his usual prayer for health and happiness with me totally conked out of sleep. But then I did something that he's never been able to explain. As soon as he said amen, apparently I bolted upright at like 90 degrees, opened my eyes fully with my face looking at the ceiling, and let out a shrieking animalistic growl lasting just a couple of seconds at such a low pitch that no grown man could even replicate it. He said that there was no color in my eyes at all, just pure black, and after that I flopped straight back down to sleep and apparently could not be woken up, even after several attempts to jolt me awake. I'm careful who I tell this story to, especially my ex-partners who have shared a bed with me over the years, but it always makes me feel terribly uneasy. I've had many other strange experiences in my life which I can't explain and sometimes wonder if it's all linked to what happened that night, but I wouldn't say my dad is a humorless man, but he's a serious person and not much of a storyteller. I know for a fact that he'd only share this with me if it were totally accurate, especially as he waited until I was an adult to even tell me. When I was about eight years old, my parents were going through a divorce at the time and me and my older sister used to spend a lot of time in our grandparents' house. It's a sort of long ranch-style home on a corner in a very nice neighborhood that's a 10-minute walk from a gas station, grocery store, and a few fast food restaurants. The streets are long and lined with well-manicured houses cradled by big, scenic California Valley hills just all around. But we were never very wealthy, though, but my grandpa bought it as a sort of fixer-upper many years ago, and the property value has skyrocketed since then. As you can imagine, it's a very safe spot, and although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing a stroller down the sidewalk outside of our house. And although my mum was especially protective all our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated, and my family knew just about everyone who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, in fact, so she was understandably trusting. She would, once in a while, let me and my sister walk to the Rotten Robbie gas station on the other end of the block to grab a snack or something to eat. I would usually get a ring pop and my sister would grab, like, three musketeers before we made our way back home. Now, my sister was about 11 at the time, and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us. There was just nothing compared to walking down that street all by ourselves in the summertime, laughing and joking around, a couple of dollar bills in our pockets, and I just felt like I owned the world. The one oddity I ever noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper parked on the side of the road opposite to the gas station, right along the back side of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade like a permanent fixture, all the windows constantly covered by opaque beige curtains. I can't explain why, but it always just gave me this deep sense of foreboding when I passed it. I was almost positive somebody was living inside of it because, at times, I would hear the air conditioning running as it just sort of sat there stagnant at that same spot. But the hairs on the back of my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, particularly as I passed the camper door, and I'd always keep an eye on it for the fear that one day it'd swing open just as I came to pass by. 
I think what bothered me the most was a drawing taped to the door from the inside. It was a, an extremely messy, uh, a sketch of odd lines in a brown colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a vague shape, but could never make out what it was intended to be. I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough to, to really investigate, but each time I walked by, I would just sort of steal a glance. Now, a year prior to the incident I'm about to describe, I was walking with my mum past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby and unfortunately had to pass the camper before we could cross the street and continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and didn't object when she walked past it. But this time though, I felt a little bit more brave. I was frustrated not being able to decipher what the drawing was for so long. While my mum was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and I took a moment to really look at the drawing. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. I remember doing a project in elementary school where we soaked printer paper in black coffee to make it look aged. And that's what this reminded me of. My mum walked on without noticing that I'd stopped following her, but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt-caked scribbles until I could make out what looked like to be a tiny sort of malformed face. And at that, my stomach turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over to the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at the time, but now I can look back and say that the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside a mass of large perfect circles like those made by a circular ring ruler. Its face was contorted, as if in pain too. It was so graphically disturbing and seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process that and the mental image still makes me sick to think about it. I've never seen anything like it before or since then, but adrenaline flooded my body and my chest hurt with fear. I selfishly thought of my glorious little trips for ring pops though and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mum. This was, in retrospect, a classically terrible idea too. It's one of those things that you scream at main characters in movies for, Ever since then, my ill feelings toward the camper had been elevated by the drawing on the door, but I even thought about it every time that we drove by, and about a month later, my mum once again graced us with several bucks and permission to walk down to Rotten Robbie and grab our respective snacks. I thought about telling my sister about what I'd seen on the way there, but she was older and braver, and I was terrified that she might make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright sunny day, and... I told myself with a false sense of certainty that nothing was going to happen. If I didn't acknowledge it, then maybe it would just go away. We walked past the camper and it was thankfully uneventful. On the walk back, I was feeling more comfortable and was focused on fighting open my candy wrapper while my sister walked alongside of me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it half as much thought as the first time. I also don't really remember what we were talking about, but I do recall being interrupted mid-sentence as my sister softly yet firmly said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on edge too, like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened and I became aware of everything, including the sound of haphazard footsteps about 10 feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavy rustling sound like a heavy backpack. And nervously, I half turned my head to take a look. A man with a long unkempt beard and wearing many layers of ragged clothing stood behind us, eyes unmistakably burning into our backs as he walked. His movements weren't normal though. It was a, a drunken shuffle, like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downward with a strange arc of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seeming genuinely intoxicated, it was almost as if he was intentionally meandering our direction like a zombie with the direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years that we'd spent living there and realized that 
This was the man who had been living inside of it. He's following us. I choked out, my eyes filling with tears now. My mind was spinning as I stared straight ahead again, the wide street and sidewalks abnormally empty all around. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt without looking my way, speaking carefully under her breath. On the count of three, we race home, okay? She told me in a very serious tone of voice. I couldn't reply through the growing lump in my throat though, but every single cell in my body understood that we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as we could. She began to count steadily while we walked faster and the most terrifying part is that he started running before we even had a chance to. He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting our direction before she got to three, but his steps were noisy and we bolted like deer the instant that we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it too. The chase felt exactly like you imagine in your nightmares. The fear that your pursuer is inches away from grabbing your arm or a fistful of hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to see or hear me. We ran so fast too that we didn't even have the breath to scream and peering back behind me about 10 seconds later, I saw him running our direction with absolutely none of the impairment that he showed with those zombie-like steps moments before. I think back on it now and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard so that we wouldn't start running. And that thought is terrifying but I just can't rationalize this any other way. We eventually made it to our grandparents' house, though, and without looking behind us, yanked open the stubborn old door before slamming it closed and scrambling past their excited dogs to get as deep into the house as possible. I don't even think we locked it, to be honest, as our main goal was getting within the light of sight of any adults as quickly as possible. My mum was talking to my grandpa at the table and gave us an amused look when we bounded into the living room. Since we were kids, running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt so safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't even want to bring it up what had just happened. Like waking up from a nightmare that you didn't want to talk about. I was just desperate to go back to normalcy. I wanted to forget it entirely, to unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal for the sake of my own sanity. And that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years back though if she remembered this incident. I'm 25 and she's 28 now. And her response was strange. She remembered immediately without the need for me to provide details, but... She quickly sort of waved it off and insisted that he had to have been a bored homeless man just sort of looking to spook some kids walking home with no real intent to harm anyone. But I don't know why. I'd like to believe that it's some sort of innocent misunderstanding, but like they always say about gut feelings, they're pretty rarely wrong. I feel in my soul that he wanted to hurt me and my sister that day. Of that, I'm sure. I never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door though and I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets though as I would hate for any other children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper in the shade. I believe that he may have chosen the spot between the park and the gas station deliberately due to the number of children walking around the area. Interestingly enough too, I never saw the camper again a day or so after this. And I'm not proud of how I handled this and would encourage anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to definitely contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around you. In the end, I don't know if maybe this whole story comes off as a melodramatic, but it was very real and it was very frightening in a way that I won't forget anytime soon. This happened over 20 years ago now. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve and my mother's family used to hold a, a large celebration at my aunt's house. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. 
We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening just talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite uh, tipsy by the time that we had to leave, so I would be doing the driving us home. It was around 11pm or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of the road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are sort of unlit. But nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. And there's a portion of this highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road, there are thick forests, and there's no lights there, obviously. And the only thing that we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and uphill through more forest. And it's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens. Something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend and ask her if she saw it too. And she confirmed that she had, but she couldn't make out what it was either. Maybe it was a coyote, as they are a fairly common sight in this area. But something just felt off about it. Whatever it was that ran in front of the car, it disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually just sort of dart out in front of cars like that. Not like that, anyway. So, for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turn the car around and I switch on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished in. I even step out of the car and I walk towards the woods. I don't see anything at first, but now it feels like perhaps I'd made a grave error because my heart was pounding and the hairs on the back of my neck are standing at full attention. But I still don't see anything unusual in the trees. When suddenly... The car's horn blasts. It's not a beeping too that you'd get if you say your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car or something. No, this was a long blaring beep. I walk back into the car and I ask my girlfriend why she leaned on the horn like that. She didn't say anything and instead she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in the direction and that was when I saw it. Surely, this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man, and he was completely naked. His skin was covered in dirt and mud, and in one of his hands he was holding something that looked like a hatchet. He looked back at us, and then he smiled and waved to us just before turning around and just walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the heck out of Dodge, and... But once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the area, he initially vanished in. He circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend, thankfully, had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. But before she honked the horn, he was allegedly walking towards me too, his hatchet raised as if ready to make the strike. We called the authorities once we got back home safely, but they never found anybody, or if they did, they just didn't tell us. But the officer that we did speak to explained his theory and said that the man was obviously looking to ambush unsuspecting lone travelers for Lord only knows what reason. And we all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life that day, as it let my potential killer know that I wasn't alone out there. I actually moved back into the area recently too, so I now drive that highway often. No naked hatchet man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant these days. Especially near Dig Creek. So my mum was really good friends with her family up the street. She would take us kids to go and visit with her all the time in fact, and... Every time my two-year-old, at the time, sister, saw a certain male of the family, she would just start screaming her head off. And yet, my mum still kept visiting them or letting them come over. Fast forward four years later, though, and the creepy man's wife passes away. She left their small daughter behind, and we come to find out that the dad got arrested for molesting the daughter. 
I guess my sister just got a bad vibe from this guy and she was spot on. A few years later though, I'm 12 years old and home alone. Another one of these family members stops by my house and since I know him, I let him in. He asks to see my room. He's about 20 years old, but me being young and naive at the time, I oblige. And as soon as he's in my room, he grabs my face and tries to kiss me. I pull away quickly and asked, what the heck does he think that he's doing? And he said that I had gotten so pretty, which made me feel sick. Luckily, we both heard the front door open and slam shut, so he rushed out. My mum realized that something was up, though, and never let anyone from this family ever come around again. For reference, I live in the UK and as I write this, it's currently 3.30 in the morning and what I've just witnessed occurred between 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the morning. So, I live across the street from an elderly couple, I'd guess around 75 years old. They seem pretty normal from the outside, although I've never really spoken to them. I usually see that their lights are out though by the time that I move into the bedroom to lay in bed for the night and not really sleep. But tonight I was laying in bed as usual watching YouTube videos on my phone when I heard what I would guess was the slamming of the boot of a car across the street. I saw the old lady getting into her car and driving away. This in itself seemed a, a bit odd since it was usually the old man that would drive. All the lights in the house had been left on but I decided to just forget about it since she might have had some sort of an emergency. I heard her drive back into the driveway around an hour later as she seemed to speed into it. She appeared to be in a hurry as she was pacing around the car fairly quickly until she disappeared into the house for a couple of minutes. When she returned, she was carrying a stepladder and some hand wipes. She placed the stepladder into the boot of the car and proceeded to use the wipes to wipe down all the window sills on the front of the house, which was weird, and once again sped off down the road. All the lights in the house were still left on, which again was strange, but I've been peering out the window for about 20 minutes now with no sign of movement in the house, which makes me wonder where the old man would be. I definitely recall seeing him earlier today as he usually waters the front garden every evening. And I don't know if I'm interpreting this wrong, but something about this just doesn't seem right. Anyway, I stayed up until just after 5am to see whether she would come back or not, but nothing more happened up to that point. I've now awoken up to see that her car is back, along with their other car that I couldn't see last night. They have a rounded driveway which isn't really completely visible from the window. I assume the other car was behind the bushes though. It is completely possible that the old man had driven somewhere that night and she had driven to join him. I agree that the unexplained behavior does seem like maybe dementia or something and it is the most likely reasoning I suppose. But for both cars to now be visible I assume that they're both in the house and I'll keep an eye on the house today for any sign of the old man. Update. So I was out during the day today and when I returned, another car was in the driveway once again with what seemed like a note stuck up on the porch window. I didn't want to walk up to the door in case someone was in there. I was heading out again for the evening but as I was pulling out of the driveway they both returned in the same car. The old lady had been driving the night before with the old man driving like he usually does. It's possible that the other car had been kept in the garage last night as well, that's where I suspect it is now but I'm still going to keep a lookout because something just seems fishy all of a sudden. This experience occurred when I was about 15 or 16. I was also with a friend of about the same age and his dad too. We were in the woods behind our houses and we lived in the same neighborhood. We went into these woods many times to hike around and play paintball and whatnot. And one day, we decided to go a little bit deeper into the woods just to, you know, check it out. A little background too is that this is an old growth forest protected wetlands that are a few square miles and surrounded by roads on all four sides, located in the northeast of the US. For a while we were just wandering along and it was mid-late spring so the forest was pretty lush and green. 
when one of us sees a small patch of white coming through the woods. It stood out pretty easily in contrast to the green leaves, so we decided to investigate and the three of us headed off in the direction towards this mysterious white spot coming through the leaves. Now, if you've ever walked through dense woods before, then you'll know it's difficult to walk in a straight line because of fallen logs and brush and whatnot. When we keep walking, though, towards this object for what seems like a while, I've racked my brain but really can't recall how long, too. But this white object still hasn't come into focus. It still looks like a, a white blot, and it's just as far away as when we first spotted it. We didn't think too much of that at first, or at least I didn't and continued walking in this direction. It must have happened two or three times that we'd walk towards this thing for a few minutes, stop and notice that we still weren't getting any closer. At this point too, I think there was a little bit of tension building, but nothing too out of the ordinary. At some point though, as we're getting closer, we notice the object is starting to fill out. But we can clearly see now that it's a tiny white house on a hill. I'd say the structure was about the size of a shed that you might keep a lawnmower in. We were excited too because, well, how often do you come across something like that? It's still a little ways away, but again, very obvious this little white house is what we had seen and been walking towards. So as we continue towards this little house, we lose it from sight momentarily as we go up and over another hill in front of it. But as soon as we get to the top of this hill, the small white house is just gone. We sort of just stand there confused, looking at each other, but then continue walking up the hill that we had previously seen this house on. This last part happened really quickly too, but we get to the top of the hill still looking at the other hills close by to see if maybe we just got turned around or something, and we'd see the little house until one of us noticed an old foundation in the ground at the top of this hill, exactly where the house had been. The shape of the foundation was exactly the size of this mysterious vanishing white house and I barely had time to notice the foundation when all three of us heard growling that got louder and louder until it must have been as loud as a chainsaw. Nothing was said too but the three of us including my friend's dad just sprinted out of the woods in the direction that we came. I don't recall ever discussing what happened with the two others I was with that day but man... Was it freaky? Since this happened, I've tried looking on Google Maps for maybe some kind of an indication that the house was there and we just lost it, but the forest is just too thick to see anything. About a year and a half ago, I told my brother what had happened and we went back into those woods looking for this house or the foundation at least, but we didn't find anything. Although our search wasn't very thorough because it was winter, so it was pretty cold and with snow on the ground it was hard to pick out what might be the White House from the surrounding snow. Long story short though, we never saw that house again. My sisters and I were teenagers, our father told us this story, which has always stuck with me all these years later of something that happened to him when he was a child of about 10 or so. So he was staying the weekend at his aunt's and uncle's apartment. Their only son, John, who was around the same age as my father, was one of my dad's closest friends and remained until John passed a few years before my dad. Anyway, one night, John and my dad were just telling scary stories to each other, sharing the bed in John's room, under the covers with a flashlight. And at some point... John had to get up to use the bathroom and was really spooked by this point and pleaded for my dad to go with him. My dad refused though and called him a baby or a chicken or something and told him to hurry up and do his thing and get back so that they could go to bed. My dad waited for his cousin a bit but before he knew it he'd laid his head back on the pillow and nodded off. But something made my dad wake up and he thought that it was maybe movement on the bed or the floor near the bed or something. Not knowing how long he'd fallen asleep though, he realized John still wasn't back from the bathroom as his side of the bed was empty. But then my dad saw something at the foot of the bed out of the corner of his eye. The bedroom was very dark and just lit by a sort of a bit of moonlight coming through the blinds on the window. And he saw something white standing there and turned the flashlight on to point it in the direction of the foot of the bed. And it was John 
wearing a white blanket over his whole body, standing there quietly. You dummy, what are you doing? Trying to scare me because I wouldn't hold your hand to take you to the potty? My dad said angrily. There was no movement from John, nor did he make any noise. You're not funny. I'm not scared. Now get in the bed, it's really late. When suddenly, the bedroom door flung open and John walked in wiping his eyes. Sorry man, I fell asleep on the toilet. Who were you talking to just now? Well, my father whipped the flashlight back to the foot of the bed and there was no figure in a white sheet standing there anymore. But my dad, he jumped out of bed immediately and ran into the living room and sat on the sofa, freaked out and near tears. He told John, but John thought that he was trying to scare him and just laughed it off and told him to come back into his bedroom and go to bed. But my dad, he wouldn't budge and said that he barely slept at all that night as he was afraid that he'd see that thing again. My father said after that night that he and John just never spoke about that incident again and it also never happened again. Like many people, I have been quarantining in my house in CA for some time now. I'm mostly spending the time hopping on work calls and gaining weight, really, but a friend told me to post this story here, so here it goes. So one night last month, around 10.30, I was eating dinner. I live in a pretty rural area where houses are spaced farther apart, and the main town square has got to be at least two miles from where I live, i.e. the police department. And that night, I get a knock on the door, which is odd at this hour, but I open it anyways, expecting that it's a package. But there are three dudes in these dirty yellow hazmat suit type things with face shields as well, and I was taken aback and mumbled something like, uh, hello? Well, one guy holding a clipboard introduced themselves as a disinfection team sent by the county and that groups of them had been going around the towns in the county to inspect houses to make sure that they're sanitized. I wasn't buying it though, so I asked them to give me a minute and I called my neighbor. I asked him about the disinfection team and he told me that it could be a scam and to ask for a warrant or call the cops. So I went back to the door to ask for a warrant and the men, they were gone. I walked out into my driveway baffled and glanced down the street. No cars in sight, just the warm night air. I contemplated calling the police, but I didn't think that it was worth it in the end. So I just went back inside, locking all the windows and heading upstairs to watch some TV. About an hour later though, I was still watching TV and I hear some things fall over in my backyard on the patio. I heard it clear as day because the patio was below the bedroom window to my left, which was wide open. I was too lazy to check it out though, so I just stuck my head out the window to look around and nearly died on the spot when I see one of those guys in the hazmat suits messing with my back door. I reacted quickly yelling, Hey, the cops are on their way! And that sure got their attention. He yelled something unintelligible and hopped the backyard fence. I saw the two other guys running around the side of my house too and they all hopped the fence and ran off into the woods beyond my house. I picked up my phone from the nightstand and dialed my local police, explaining the situation as I could still see the yellow figures disappearing into the woods. The cops eventually came though and we made a very creepy discovery. The two guys who had been around the side of my house apparently been trying to pry open my dining room window with a crowbar. I asked if they could check it for fingerprints and I kid you not, one of the officers responded with, what do you think this is, the CIA? And quite honestly, that just really ticked me off. I don't know what it is, but it just seems like small town police officers don't really care. At least the ones where I live anyway. But the men had been wearing gloves anyway, so it didn't matter in the end. But I guess I just wanted to inform everyone and let this be a lesson, because I sure do hope that nobody else falls victim to this kind of scam. So 
So about two years ago, a friend of mine had moved into his own apartment. The sofa that was in it was old and worn, so he decided that he would try and find one in better condition. And he asked me to help him to look for one, as my dad had a van and we would need to use that to transport the sofa. So we went on Craigslist to have a look at what other people had for sale. We came across one ad that stated a three-seater cream leather sofa, great condition, free to first viewer. There was a picture of it and it honestly looked in perfect condition, so we thought that we would try and snap it up. Now, the ads had been there for a week or so, so we thought that maybe it was already gone and that they just hadn't taken the ad down yet or something. So my friend decided to contact the seller and nearly instantly got a reply saying that they still had the sofa and it was available if we could collect it. I was a bit wary that it was still available. I mean, a free sofa in perfect condition that had been up for a week? Nobody has taken it yet? I don't know, but we thought that maybe there was something wrong with it that could only be noticed when viewing the sofa and it was maybe hidden from the pictures or something... It was a weekend though and we had no plans so we decided that we would just go and check it out anyway. So my friend contacted the seller back and organized a time and a place to meet up. They decided on a local McDonald's car park at 9pm as the seller said that he was in work until 8pm and would need time to get ready after work. The seller said that he would be driving a green Honda Accord with a trailer too. So we pulled up to the McDonald's car park at around 8.50pm there were loads of people around, so we had really no reason to think that we would be in danger or anything. At about 8.55, my friend got a text saying that the seller was about 15 minutes away, and they asked him to describe what vehicle we were in, and so he did so. About five minutes after we had texted the seller what vehicle we were in, an overweight man around 50 years old, I would say, with a grey scruffy beard and greasy hair, approached the driver's side window of the van, which was my side as I was driving the van. He was wearing a plain white t-shirt with what looked like maybe food stains all over it, with black jeans with holes torn in them and dried up mud stains all over them, along with a pair of black steel toe cap boots also covered in dry mud. He knocked on my window, so I rolled it down. Uh, you boys here for the sofa? He said in a sort of gravelly voice. It sounded like he needed to cough, but couldn't get it out. Uh, yeah, I said to him. Rob's car's just back down the road a bit, and uh, his phone battery died. I was with him, and I walked up to get you guys. He's with the car waiting for AA, but you can come down and collect the sofa off of him there if you want. Me and my friend just sort of looked at each other, unsure of what to think. Can I get in your van, and we'll go back to Rob together? The guy asked. How far down the road is he? I asked before he replied. Uh, not too far, but I need to show you where to go, right? At this stage, my friend pretended to get a phone call. Uh, hello? Oh, yeah? Oh, no way. Really? Well, we'll be right there, he said before pretending to hang up his phone. He looked at me and said, Hey man, we gotta go. My dad needs us to help him with a flat tire. I nodded, knowing that it was a fake call for us to get the heck away from this creepy guy. We've got to go now, but we'll contact you tomorrow about the sofa, all right? The guy just stared at us as I rolled up my window and started to drive away. Me and my friend, we looked at each other. Well, that was creepy, man. I got really bad vibes from that guy, man. What about you? And my friend said, definitely. We decided to drive around the back of the car park to see if we could find out if that guy was up to something or not. We could see him standing in the same spot where we left him and he was now on the phone, but as he put his phone down, about two minutes later, a car pulled up with three men in it and he got in. My friend's phone started ringing and it was the number of Rob, the guy who was supposedly giving away the sofa, and he answered... Hey, uh, can you meet tomorrow and I can hold onto the sofa for you until then if you want? As he was on the phone, I noticed one of the men in the car had collected the creepy guy who was also on the phone too. My friend told Rob that he would contact him tomorrow, that he was busy and couldn't talk right now. And at the same time that my friend hung up the phone, the guy who was in the car also finished his phone call. 
At this point, I explained to my friend that there was probably no car that had broken down and that that creepy guy was trying to lure us somewhere so as the guys in the car could do, well, who knows what to us. We drove home and my friend blocked the number of Rob and uh, we never did hear from them again. We reported the ad as well and funnily enough, it was removed the very next day. This happened when I was six years old. I'm 22 and female now. When my family traveled to British Columbia for my aunt's wedding. I was the flower girl and the wedding took place at a more remote church ground beside the ocean with beautiful docks. The wedding went off without a hitch and I tossed some flowers and scratched my itchy dress. Following the ceremony, everyone came outside to do photos on the docks and stuff. I got distracted, sort of playing in the dirt while the wedding party moved down the dock without me. My mum, of course, was distracted talking to her sister, and I was usually glued to her side anyway. But while I was drawing in the dirt with a stick, a man in a suit approached me. He didn't look dangerous and said that he was a cousin or something of my now uncle. He did look familiar to me, but I didn't know why and I couldn't put my finger on it. He said that my mum and my auntie had tasked him with watching me while they took photos and stuff. I didn't know any better, so he took my hand and began walking me back to the church where the reception would be, but towards the dirt road leading out of the property. Everything went fine and dandy, and we were now almost up the road where a tree line blocked the exit, when I heard my mum scream, don't you effing touch my daughter, and turned around to see her running down the dock towards us. Now, for context, my mum is a sort of heavier woman and that is the fastest that I've ever seen her run in my life. She looked absolutely foaming at the mouth and raged, but the man squeezed my hand like he was going to make a break for it. But I guess that he decided otherwise when the rest of the guests saw my mum scream running and started making a beeline for us too. He jumped into the woods beside the dirt road. Nobody recognized him and... When the police came, there wasn't much that they could do because a statement from a scared six-year-old, well, it isn't very useful. The police ended up assigning someone to sit at the only entrance to the property while the reception took place in case that he came back for whatever reason. My mum kept me glued to her and left a little early with my brother and I after that too. But it dawned on me when we were going back to the hotel that the man was from the hotel. I think that I had seen him looming around about the swimming pool and in the continental breakfast room. Apparently he was eavesdropping and somehow found out that we were going to that wedding. I told my mum and she was furious. She told the hotel front desk and got me to tell them what he looked like. And with the key information that he was wearing a suit, they told us that he had already checked out in a hurry and left. They said that they would file a police report with the information that he had provided when checking in, though he paid for the room with cash, so there was no way of knowing if it was actually an alias or if it was him. My mum decided to take us to another hotel on the other side of town that night. The police never followed up with her, and a few days later we went back to my home province. And I just don't think I ever really understood how much danger I was in until I got a little bit older. I grew up in a small town with no more than a few stoplights and a few thousand residents in the Great Basin Desert of the Western US. For those that have never been, you cannot begin to understand just how vast and isolated you can become in my home state. It is a breeding ground for strange people to hide out from the law, keep to themselves and do whatever it is that they want to remain secret. As someone who frequently spends days exploring isolated vast stretches of deserts, hours away from cell service in some cases, I unfortunately have a few stories where I was held at gunpoint or thought that I was going to be taken, but those are for another time. This is my earliest encounter with someone that I honestly wish that I never met. So the valley is where this story takes place and it's one where they found a family murdered just a few months prior to my encounter in fact. I didn't know this at the time and while probably not connected it gives you a feel for what happens in the desert. 
I was roughly 12 at the time, 22 male now, and was with my mum and three younger brothers. My dad and uncle were prospecting for gold and we got bored, so we thought that we would go for a hike down into the valley to an abandoned miner's shack, probably two miles away. No biggie, we've done this many times to pass the time and it's cool to see the old ruins. No two, my dad and uncle had the pistols and we didn't. So we get down there with no issues and the shack looks clearly abandoned and is in disrepair. It looks to be from the 1930s and is kind of resting on a small hill with a dirt road leading to it. Well, we go inside to explore and all is good until I see one of the old shelves with brand new canned goods on it, fresh paper wrappers and all that stuff. I thought to myself that that was odd but figured some backpackers must have left them for the next guy or something. But boy was I wrong. So we keep exploring this house until I come into a room and see something that I will remember for as long as I live. That feeling you get when you instantly just know that something is horribly wrong. That struck me hard. And that room had a fresh house cat hung from the rafters of the ceiling with its abdomen slit right open, intestines hanging out everywhere. It had to have only been a few days old too and I never let my mum or brother see it, I just ran to the room that they were in and said that we need to go right now. I just said that I had a bad feeling because of those cans and we got out of the house and were about 50 feet away when my brother insists that he needs to go to the bathroom. I didn't tell them what I saw because, well, I knew that it would freak them out and he, and he just had to go so here we are, a baseball throws away from this house and my brother is going to the bathroom. But just as he finishes from the backside of the hill of the shack is on comes an old white beat up van and I remember thinking that this might just be it. I will probably never see my dad again. They'll never even know what happened to us. When out of the van I remember vividly seeing four men step out and look in our general direction. I picked up my youngest brother and my mum and the other two brothers all took off running and I've never felt more scared than in that moment. I didn't dare look back to see if they were trailing after us. I couldn't make myself to be honest. But after what feels like forever, we finally get out of the valley and meet up with my dad and my uncle. We tell them our story and we all just get the heck out of there. But to this day, I still can't help but wonder if I would have been alive today had I not seen the dead cat before those guys got to that shack. I guess I may never know, but... It's also weird that that murder happened not long before we stumbled across these strange men. If anyone has ever driven in Alabama, then you know that it can be a very creepy state to drive through. And I'm not really sure where to start with this story, but I've had a few experiences with the paranormal in this place, which... I plan to share at some point, but this is my only cryptid experience. I'm really not sure what we witnessed too, but we got a good look at whatever it was in broad daylight, and the sighting happened just before noon. So my girlfriend and I had some time off work, so we decided on a much needed getaway for a long weekend. This was early 2019, late January or February, so it was pretty darn cold at the time. That being said, the southern US, it doesn't get that cold, right? But this was one of those rare days when it was like 30 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit range. But we were on a highway in a sort of swampy area. I have no idea the exact location, but I can say that it was southern Alabama and close to Mississippi. There were lots of bridges, I remember, and I wish we could have gotten picks, but the car was moving around 60 miles per hour when it happened. So we're just driving along and all of a sudden my girlfriend cries out for me to look and I turn my head to glimpse a grotesque looking creature. This thing was hunched down on all fours, possibly eating something maybe? This all happened so quickly that it's hard to tell but I slowed down to get a better look at it. When all of a sudden this thing stands on two legs and has what looks like a humanoid figure, all except the head. The head was goat-like, but it had the body of a man. There were horns, and overall the head area resembled a light-colored goat. 
but the creature started back towards the woods and we just booked it. And we continued with our trip, but we just couldn't stop talking about what we had just witnessed. Like I said, I can't be 100% sure of what we actually saw. It all happened so quickly. But my girlfriend swears that it was a man with a goat head, and I'm certain that I saw the same thing. If anyone has any insight into any sort of cryptids of this type or a similar sighting, then I would love to hear it. Stay safe out there, guys, because who knows what's in the woods. A few years ago, when I first started university, my dad actually bought a new house. This was in a new residential neighborhood, and his reasoning in buying a new house is so that he can secure a new property before the housing prices rose again. True to his word, after renovations were done and we were ready to move in, the market value of the house before renovation doubled, sitting at like US 120 grand or something. And staying at this new house, all was going pretty well. My room is like four times larger than my old one, so I'm not complaining. Only downside is, other than having to move 40 minutes away and leaving behind my gang, is that we moved at the start of the new semester and I would be staying at the dorms. No big deal though, it's not like I would be stuck there for like months on end, right? Corona. During one of my visits home, my room felt just off though. As though something else had stayed there maybe. I did ask my mother if someone had stayed over, but she answered no, and I don't know, maybe I was just tired from the trip back or something. That or the stupid amount of assignments handed out was giving me anxiety. Shrugging it off though, I just went about my day as normal. Night came, and as I was watching anime, finally having some time to watch some in peace, I only stopped when the clock read like 2am or something, and I was getting comfortable in bed is when I heard it. Some soft scratching noises and light thumps coming from the ceiling. Okay, I thought to myself, what the heck is that? The noises persisted, soft scratching followed by small thumps, as though something was walking on the ceiling. It went on, going from one end of the ceiling to the other, passing over me several times. At this point, I was too sleepy to worry about this, and I just chalked it up to either squirrels or bats or something. And not unusual too, since I had went up to the ceiling at some point in my life and found squirrel scat everywhere. But settling down now, I did my best to ignore the noises, and eventually I drifted into a fitful sleep. But this went on for maybe like several months. Every time I went home and night fell, I would hear those scratching and thumping noises whenever it gets late. At this point, I stopped staying up late into the night and I went to bed early, but for some reason, the noises would occur regardless on whether I went to bed at like 9pm or 3am. Always scratching, always thumping. I would wake up at odd hours, half an hour would pass, but it felt as though I was asleep for longer. Well, four hours would feel like ten minutes, and I actually discussed to my mother about this, but she claims that she never heard anything. At this point, I had convinced myself that it was a squirrel or a bat problem, refusing to believe that my house was haunted and, to be more specific, my room. I told myself that when my dad gets home from his work overseas and I'm home too, maybe I'll discuss hiring a, an exterminator. But fast forward a month, my dad returned from Saudi Arabia and was enjoying the quiet at home. I was staying in the dorms when he returned, and we talked on the phone a lot, and when it was time to go home, my family picked me up at the university instead of waiting for me to arrive at the train station, and we chatted, had lunch, drove around a bit, and then went home. But when I entered my room, the tiles felt sandy, almost gravelly. I looked down, and I saw the floor was sprinkled with salt and peppercorns. I hesitated entering my room, then I just thought, oh, what the heck. I gave a Salem and I entered. For the first time since I stayed at that house too, my room actually felt like my room. After sorting out my stuff, I went down and enjoyed family time, but 
I felt like I needed to ask about the peppercorn and the salt, but thought against it at that time. Maybe after night prayers. Come night, after the whole family finished night prayers in the living room downstairs, I asked my dad what the peppercorn and the salt was about. I saw his face go from calm to what looked like grim, and he laid out what happened in the past two days. So when we came home, as usual, he would lead prayers in the living room with my mum. It happened during night prayers when he gave the last Salem. For clarification, we're a Muslim family if you haven't guessed already, but as he gave it, he heard something sort of scamper upstairs. Not animal scampers either. These were unmistakably human steps running up the stairs. My dad immediately froze, debating to himself on whether it was just his imagination or if he actually heard it. His answer came when my mum tapped him on the shoulder and asked, Honey, did you hear that? Like something running up the stairs. My dad turned to my mum and nodded, confirming that it wasn't just his imagination. Something was watching when they prayed. And when he was done, it ran off up the stairs. The following day was apparently a blur. They contacted the local imam and asked his help to settle the issue. The imam with his personal congregation visited the house and, after assessing it, went forward with the fencing ritual. A fencing ritual was a ritual to put up a barrier around the targets. That's where the salt and the peppercorns came from and the species of whatever was residing in our house hated salt and peppercorn as it burns them apparently, but after they made the barrier they held a Quran recitation downstairs in the living room and another in my room. And apparently the thing made its home in my room and was trying to expand downstairs. After the recitation was done and they had left, my dad asked my mum if I had asked anything weird in the past few weeks or months when he wasn't here. She confirmed that, yes, I had actually asked once, but that was it. And a week before my dad returned home, she started hearing those same noises in her room ceiling. Soft scratches followed by thumping sounds. After all of this was told, I just sort of sat there in silence. I'd be lying if... I said that I wasn't spooked, and after dinner I excused myself to my room, saying that I just wanted an early night. I lied though, instead staying up till like 2am, watching anime silently on my laptop to just kill some time. And as I tucked myself into my sheets, I closed my eyes and I listened. Apart from the occasional barking from the strays and occasional car cruising by, it was quiet. A peaceful quiet, as my drowsiness consumed me. The one thing crossed my mind though. Finally, I can get some sleep.